Hello and welcome to the NC podcast. My name is Natasha Collins and I am the founder of NC Real Estate, which includes its members club for landlords and property investors to come and build a profitable property portfolio that completely aligns with their goals. It's launch week. We're open. The members club has its doors open. We hardly ever do it. Only every year, we only open it maybe two or three times a year. And we have no plans to open it up again before the end of the year. So if you have thought about joining the members club, it's been on the back of your mind to get in contact with me to do that. Maybe you've wanted some help, some guidance, some support for the members club or for property investment forever. And you're not sure who to turn to, come and join me in the members club. You have to go to www.ncrealestatemembersclub.com. Again, www.ncrealestatemembersclub.com. Once you get there, you can click join and you can either join on a monthly subscription of £59 a month or on an annual subscription of £590 per year. Once you jump into the members club, here's what will happen. You will see a welcome package. I want you to go through that welcome package. It will take you no longer than 10 minutes. But what it will do is show you how to go through and use the on line resources and the online resources are broken up into packages of information depending on where you are in your property investment journey so what you will do is you will have a look around the whole of the members club you will see how to book your one-to-one strategy sessions how to join the facebook community how to get in contact with the nc real estate team every time you need help And then once you know all of that, you can get started on the property investment success cycle. And by going through the property investment success cycle, again, it won't take you very much longer than about 15 minutes. Honestly, you can do this very, very quickly. You'll be able to see what action you need to take next in order to start seeing massive results. So it is incredibly, incredibly easy to jump in and start taking action and you will be guided the whole way through. If you need support, both myself and my team are here to help you. And you can also get strategy sessions, one-to-one support, drop-in Q&A sessions. You've got all of the support that you need in the Facebook group, plus all of my online material. It's everything you need to build a successful property portfolio. And here's what we're talking. We're talking long-term security rather than really, really quick. Invest, 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 short-term gains, which just don't go anywhere. I am all about building assets for life and building that income that can provide for you in the long term. That's what we're doing with the Members Club That's why you jump in and you start going through the materials and you start taking consistent action. Now, if you're thinking, Natasha, I just do not have time. That's cool. You do not have to spend that much time on this at all. I recommend anywhere between 15 minutes to 60 minutes a week. That's less than an hour, but you will get huge, huge, huge amounts of results just through taking that really, really simple, consistent action. And if you want any guidance of the one little thing that you should do, you just get in contact with us. Tell us what you're stuck with and we will point you in the right direction. The whole point is to make this as seamless for you as possible so that you can actually get going towards where you want to be. So if the members club is for you, and I really think it is, you need to sign up now because the doors close at midnight on Thursday the 8th of August. So that is two days after this podcast comes out. And then we're closing the doors and we're going to get going with the new members and you should be one of them. So again, head to 
ncrealestatememersclub.com. The link will be in the show notes. I recommend you sign up as quickly as possible. And then once you're in there, grab your one-to-one so that you and I can have that conversation. I'm very, very excited to see you in there. I'm so excited to get to know you and your property investments and help you along your journey because trust me, you deserve to build the financial abundance and that security that you want. After all, that's what we're here for. So then we can start looking forward to our futures and building a lifestyle that we really, really enjoy. So I can't wait to see you in there. Okay. So now you've gone and joined the members club, I want to talk to you about a subject that's so close to my heart this week. It's something that I've been really, really working on with myself and that's called savings. I've been talking more and more about money recently and over the last couple of years, I've really been aiming to improve my money knowledge and put myself in more of a secure position. And the reason is, is that over the years and over my late teens and my 20s, I actually wasn't that great with money. I I really wasn't. And it was because I didn't understand it. When I earned more, I spent more. It was as simple as that. And my first foray into debt was during university. Now, I still have a student loan for those of you who are thinking, my gosh, Natasha, what kind of student loan did you rack up? That's fine because obviously that gets paid off on a piecemeal basis, either for your end of year taxes or through the payroll system. So it wasn't my student loan that was the problem. The problem was the amount that I was spending versus the amount that I was making. I've always had a job since I was 15 in fact, slightly earlier than that, when I was 12, I got a paper round. I was delivering the Bath Chronicle for years. And then when I was 15, I got a job as a chambermaid at a local hotel. And every weekend I'd go there, um, four hours Saturday, four hours Sunday. And it was two weeks on, one week off. And I used to spend that money on just things that I wanted. So I don't know, usually it was clothes for sixth form or buying stuff that I wanted when my parents didn't give me a huge amount of pocket money. I think it was only a couple of pounds a a week. So they were really happy uh, when I went out and got a job. And I did that. And then I moved on to working um, in Dorothy Perkins as a shop assistant. And I took that with me to university, but they would only give me eight hours of work a week. And eight hours of work a week really on minimum wage isn't enough to live off of and so university living by myself was a huge shock so I wasn't getting in as much as I I needed and I wasn't very good at looking after my money so inevitably I was spending more than I was earning And also the bank gave me a free overdraft. So it was interest free up until the point that I graduated. And they would just keep extending that for me. Every time we went into the bank, they'd be like, oh yeah, sure, we give you another couple of hundred pounds. So for me, it was like easy money, fabulous. Got to the end of my second year and the, I, one very fateful day, um, I remember that I'd hit the end of my overdraft and I'd not realized I'd hit the end of my overdraft. So I kept going to the cash machine, trying to withdraw money. Uh, I'd gone out for dinner with my friends, tried to pay for it and my card kept getting declined. I was like, well, the bank just increased my overdraft. So why wouldn't I have any money left? Went to the bank and said, hey, can you extend my overdraft again? And they said, no, that was it. I was at the end of my money and we were at the end of semester for uh, the second year of university. And I remember calling my dad and saying, I'm out of money. I don't know what to do next. And he said, tough, 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 tough. I will transfer you the amount of money it's going to cost you to fill up your car. You drive home and this summer you work your ass off to go and pay back all of that debt on your credit card. So he did as he said, he transferred me 40 pounds or a little bit less, however much it was to fill up my polo in those days. And I filled up my polo and I drove back to Bath. And he said, okay, well, you've got 
Dorothy Perkins. I was still working at Dorothy Perkins at the time and I'd been um, promoted to Sunday supervisor. So I had weekend hours. Now I was doing eight hours on a Saturday, eight hours or seven hours on a Sunday. So I now had quite a decent amount of hours under my belt, but that was no way near enough to pay off this massive credit card <laughs> overdraft that I had. So I started ringing around companies in Bath and asking if I could do anything to cover their holidays period for the summer whilst I was off work. And Future Publishing, who are a great publishing house, they do magazines, um, they said to me, why don't you come and cover the reception in one of our main offices? So what I did that summer was Monday to Friday, I worked full time for Future Publishing covering their reception desk and on a Saturday and Sunday, I worked for Dorothy Perkins as their weekend supervisor. And it was tough working seven days a week. Um, whether it was legal or not, I'm not sure, but I, my, my dad was adamant that I had to get myself out of this situation where my credit card or my debit card or whatever it was at the time was at the end of its credit limit that was it maxed out um, and I wasn't even paying any minimum payments on it because there was no interest payable on it can you even imagine and so I did I worked every single day and I got myself out of this debt within three months my parents had said look we won't ask you for rent whilst you're at home but you must put every single bit of money back into paying off that card and I did and then they said to me, well, what are you going to do with the leftovers? Because it was a couple of thousand pounds that I had to pay back. And I said to them, well, I really want to go traveling after university. And they were like, well, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go and travel the whole of the United States of America. And they were like, right, okay, well, how are you paying for that? And that was kind of an eye-opening thing because actually you don't just click your money and you sit, you click your fingers and money just falls from... The, the, the trees or the sky or wherever you think you're going to get it from. And they said, well, why don't you start putting away a little bit of money every month and see where you get to um, by the time that you want to leave to go to America. And I thought, great, OK, I am going to do that. But then the thought struck me that come term time, when I had to go back to Worcester to go back to university, there was going to be no way that I could live off of that Dorothy Perkins four hours a week again. There was gonna be no way, so what was I going to do? And I thought with my newfound admin experience from being a receptionist at Future Publishing, I could start applying for different jobs or admin positions in Worcester. And I thought, well, again, I've now shown that I can work seven days a week. I don't want to work seven days a week, but I can then start getting stuff done around um, my working hours. It would be more important for me to be working in my third year and earning a decent living than it would for me to always be studying and in the library, maybe I could be a bit more efficient with my time. So I started applying for jobs and I got an interview with Belvoir Lettings in Worcester and I remember going and seeing Steve, the uh, owner of, or the, the franchise owner of that Belvoir Lettings and he said to me, Natasha, do you know why I've interviewed you today? And I was like, I have no idea. Um, but I said, I hope I've got a good CV. And he said to me, you're the only person who's handed in a CV that can spell. So I, la I laughed and he said, I appreciate that you're going into your third year of university. How can we make this work? And I thought to myself, do you know what? I, I will commit to doing pretty much full-time hours if I can, but I need to be able to go to university and do my lectures. And he said as a compromise, if he covered the office while I was at lectures, in the afternoons, I could do my university work whilst manning the desks for him. So in the morning, I'd do all his admin work. I'd have a lunch break, probably in my lunch break, do a couple of viewings. And in the afternoon, I would then do my university work whilst manning the phones. Come five o'clock, I would then go out and do viewings for him. And he would pay me a full time salary. Can you believe in my third year of university, this guy was going to pay me full time salary? I was blown away. So that then left me to think, OK, well, how do I make my lectures as efficient as possible so I can earn as much money as possible? 
So I went to the university and I switched around some of my lectures. So I only had Monday afternoon and evening lectures in the first semester. And in the second semester, I think that switched to a Thursday. And I don't quite like thinking back on it now, I must have already had skills in negotiation because I don't quite know how I'd managed to wangle myself such a good third year or maybe I was being completely shortchanged from paying that much to go to university and only having to go in one day a week but all right let's not go too deep into that um and that's what I did for my third year of university I worked full time and sometimes I did Saturdays for an extra pay but then I actually did have weekends off so I was back working full-time hours, studying full-time, shall we say it was a full-time degree, handing in, getting my work done. And actually in my third year of university, I was getting firsts across the board, which was mad considering I had more on. And I was also saving. So I was managing to put away 300 to 500 pound a month. It was one of the craziest yet most eye-opening things that I could have learned is having to fend for myself and do it granted I could not now go out in the evenings uh, with all my friends every single night because I'd have to get up and be at work for 8 30 the next morning and that sometimes did play a bit of havoc but then occasionally I'd let my guard down and be like right I'm going out and you know what if tomorrow morning is difficult well I'd, I'd get up an hour early and I'd walk to work I'd walk to work um, so that I would, by the time I got there, I was feeling bright and ready and fresh and ready to go. And when I got to work, I also had a company car, which bizarre for a 20 year old who is kind of like fresh faced, new to this. But then I also knew that during that time, I was in my third year, so I was about to go out to the wide world of work. And if I wanted to take time off to go traveling, well, I was going to have to have something set up. And so during that time as well, I would also use some of my lunch hours when I didn't have viewings to go to interviews or phone interviews or try and see as many people as possible. And I must have applied to 40 or 50 jobs in that period. And it was hectic because I was trying to juggle everything, but I was thriving because I love having that much always going on. (coughs) excuse me so that was kind of the first the first kind of movement I had into into learning how to save I had five thousand pounds saved up by the time I'd got to June that year and I remember buying my ticket to America I was flying to New York spending some time in New York and going literally a u-shape i did a u-shape from new york although i went up to boston came back down all the way down to uh, miami and the florida keys flew over to mexico spent a couple of weeks in mexico and then went back up via california all the way up to san francisco and flew home over those three months and in those three months i then got myself a job as a surveyor in london based upon contacts that i'd met in worcester because i'd been working full time and actually speaking to full-blown adults who were in the property industry and And I'd got this job in London. My boss at the time had said, I've also got a flat in London. Do you want to rent it off of me? I'd kind of fallen on my feet, like stumbled out of stumbled out of traveling for that long (laughs) into a job in London where I was getting paid significantly more than I ever had. And I'd once been good with money and I had again fallen off the bandwagon. And it took me again a while whilst I was in London because I was like, wow, bright lights, big city, all of this going on. Like, I just want to be part of it. I want to make new friends. I want to be going out every night. I want to be part of this new property industry that I'm a part of. And I want to be seeing people and I want to be doing X, Y and Z. And so again, I fell back into this trap as a 21 year old, bright lights, big city. I'm living in this amazing flat in Parsons Green, beautiful part of London. I had fallen on my feet and was getting paid well. So I was determined to spend that money that I was earning. And I went back to living pretty much paycheck to paycheck on more money and never sunk in that I'd needed to start saving. Um, And as I've said before, I started, 
I was very quickly promoted to asset manager and again that came with a pay rise and then I wanted to buy my first property because I saw that property prices were reasonable in London and rather than saving I just went to my parents with a business plan where I say I just like this took a lot of convincing and I said hey let me borrow this money for a time and I'll pay you back um and I bought that first flat and then I had more money coming in. I was like, my gosh, you know, I'm a money making machine over here. Again, paycheck to paycheck, spending my money and not really seeing what was going on. I then remortgaged that flat two years later that I bought in London and taken a hundred thousand pounds out of it. <laughs> and I'd been promoted a couple of times and still guys still I'd never got it into my head that I needed to be good with money right that this is the lesson that I'm teaching you is that I'd worked my way up everything I had done I had done it for myself I had made sure that every time I'd borrowed money from my parents and it was that one time to buy the flat in London I'd paid that back so it wasn't as if I wasn't getting money. It was the fact that I was terrible with it. I just, it would come in, I'd lose it. And then at the end of the month, I'd be like, well, how have I got more months than money? It's a stupid thing to be doing it. Uh, you know, but I was reckless, I was young. I was like, you know, life goes on forever. Life goes on forever. I don't need to worry about my pension. I, well, I just bought myself this rental in, in Notting Hill. That would just pay for it, whatever. Oh, it doesn't happen like that. Because when I then went out to start my own business and I'd built a property portfolio by this time and I thought I was the bee's knees at everything, it just did not go how I wanted it to. And that was where my real money education started because now I had to control the ins and outs of my company plus forecast for the future because inevitably when you start a company which I had never ever thought about was that some months you're going to have worse months than others and that's inevitable and here's the other thing that I didn't think about until I got faced with that situation yes when you're earning really nicely you can get a really big mortgage when you're not earning very nicely anymore, the mortgage companies aren't going to look at you even at remortgage time. And I'd shot myself in the foot by never thinking far enough ahead to have something in the bank. And it now blows my mind with how three years on from starting the business, I look back and think how naive I was and how much struggling I had to go to, through to get myself back into a financially secure position where actually now I'm okay, I'm fine. Like I'm fine again. But someone who had a property portfolio, a high paid job where she could have saved, couldn't even pretty much afford to go out and live. I think I was living off like five to 10 pounds a day because I'd never forecasted for it. And I had to learn pretty damn quickly that life is never going to just support you. I was riding high because I was in a great position and then I put myself in a situation where I could not be in that good position. And that's where I started actually learning about how to use my money wisely and start reinvesting it into property and making sure that I was looking after myself. And so what, I've, what I have done since is look at where my pension was, how much I've got in my property portfolio, how much I've got as an income coming in, how much I've actually got coming in from things like the university and some other consulting bits and pieces that I do do occasionally and how I can put some of that, just a percentage of that away for the future. And it's completely changed everything in my financial outlook around. So now that I have a plan to pay down on some of the mortgages, that means that over the next 10 to 20 years, those mortgages will be gone on some of the properties, not all of them. Some of them are going to be uh, remortgaged and I will probably dispose of them at some stage. I've also got savings accounts with stocks and shares, ISAs, which grow on an average of about 7% per annum. And I just pay like, I started off by paying 
10, 20 pounds a week into it and have slowly upped that to 300 to 500 pounds a month. And even this week on a phone call to my accountant where we're now starting to look at the end of year accounts from 2018, 2019, he's like, well, do you know what? You're in a good position now where your business can start paying your, your into your pension pot because that's a very tax efficient way of doing it. You can start paying yourself an actual proper salary from your business. You can make sure that your property portfolio is now going into a savings, a savings pot. And that means that now I've got money coming in from so many different places that that adds together pretty quickly to start allowing me to reinvest. I've even started dabbling in stocks and shares because I've become so financially aware of what I need to have in place in order to survive should anything go wrong that I'm now using my assets wisely. And that's what I really, really implore you to do. I've given you this long story of the past 15, 16 years of my life where sometimes I've been money literate, sometimes I've not been money literate. And I don't, wouldn't change anything because it's brought me to where I am right now. But what I want you to start doing is actually having a look at what is going on in your financial life and look at okay, well, I do, I do invest in property or I'd love to invest in property. Well, what money is that going to take and where is that coming from? And then once you've got that, you can start looking forward and looking forward and giving yourself that ability to then go, okay, I'm going to have a pot here. I'm going to have a pot here and I'm going to put that together because that's going to allow me to buy an investment which is going to secure this or it's going to allow me to start on my business or it's going to allow me to grow x y and z it's going to give me security fabulous because if you're then looking forward to 20 years time maybe even 10 years time 25 years time and you go in that time actually through all of the different investments I'm making, the different savings I'm making, uh, my assets growing, even if they grow and fall, you take it at average and you have a look at what you're going to have in the future. My gosh, it adds up. For me, it adds up to millions and millions of pounds. And that's through the last three years of just getting everything back on track. And even still, like starting to invest in my, uh, invest properly in my late 20s it still gives me that security and you don't have to be in your 20s 30s 40s to start investing you can do it later but what I'm saying is if you can buy these assets look at the long term not just the short term I started by looking at the short term and what extra I had coming in and that was brilliant guys that was honestly it was brilliant I set myself up without even knowing that long term that was going to be helpful I was looking at the returns I was looking at the fact that this property was going to go up in value I knew what I was investing in but I just couldn't keep hold of my money long enough to make sure that it was going to work for me in the future as well because I'm very good at finding lump sums of money and investing it wisely but the smaller the smaller tinier parts I wasn't great at you know the fact that on a monthly basis, I would get X, Y, and Z in and then just spend it. And what I actually needed to do was start saving first. So the day the money comes in is the day that a portion of it goes into uh, stocks and shares I saw, or it goes into a savings account, or it goes into wherever I've decided to put it for the month. And then that builds so that I can buy something bigger. I'd not ever used, I'd never really thought about that. And now it's a way of life. And through putting that into my day-to-day money planning, as well as my property investments and combining it all, the big impact that that's going to have over the long term of my life, my gosh, is it's crazy just making those slight changes. So for you property investors, if you want to be property investors, if you haven't yet invested I also want you to start looking at the small stuff as well as the big stuff. Investing in property is vital because it does give you that extra income. I know I've survived on it for the last couple of years. Uh, For the last couple of years, for the last 10 years or just less that I've been investing in. But you also have to look at what small things can I do on a monthly basis just to give me a little bit more financial security and the small things add up to big things. So as a result of this podcast, I want you to go and have a look at your finances. Where is it going? 
what are you doing with it? If you're living paycheck to paycheck, on the day that your money comes into your bank account, can you just put a hundred pounds in an ISA somewhere? Can you do that and then build it up and then reinvest it into property? If you've got a rental income, do you need it all? Or can you put a little bit of it into investments? Even as far as maybe you've got a rewards account on one of your serviced accommodations like I do. And now the rewards that I get, even though it's like 15 pounds a month that goes into a savings account, it all matters. And then that grows into something bigger. The impact of doing that now will change your future, but also give you more flexibility when it comes to investing. Because mortgage lenders as well love to see that you're saving. I didn't really have too much of appreciation for that before, but I have now got that over the years. So being good with money isn't about just investing and then spending the money. Being good with money is investing, having that income, using some of it, of course, to have fun, do what you need to do, but also reinvesting it for the future. And that's now part of what I bring to the members club as well, because I firmly believe that we all deserve financial security in the future. And I firmly believe that anybody can do it because if me with my mindset can do it, you can do it too. You can find the, find the money just even a little bit and just get into that small habit. Small habits grow and they create big results. So I hope that helps you. And I hope my stories have, have helped you see that it is possible to turn it around and you can be reckless. I don't, I don't, um, I don't regret it. Like it's all part of my story. It's part of my life. It's how I've learned. But I want you to hear that too. So you can start thinking, okay, I don't have to sacrifice everything to have a fabulous life. In fact, I don't ever look at it as, as, as a sacrifice. Just look at it as it is what it is. I do that so that I can grow things for the future and invest harder. So we're now pretty much at the end of this podcast. But what I want to remind you is that if you've listened to this and you're inspired and you are inspired to invest, you're inspired to set yourself up for the future, please come and join the members club. It's www.ncrealestatemembersclub.com where we look at investing, we look at your money and we look at how we can set you up for financial abundance and security in the future. And if you want to know that and you want that education, you want to have money here and property investments and start growing that, that is the place to be. And I cannot wait to see you over there. Thank you for coming and joining me today. I cannot wait to catch up with you again soon.